book is called The Visual Organization. It's about big data, data discovery, how companies are actually turning what we call big data into information and then acting on that information. And a bit about me to start off, I'm Phil. Hi, <laughs> Phil. Hello. I have written a bunch of books. The most recent is this one, The Visual Organization. It's been out for about a week and a half. When I'm not writing, I am speaking and consulting. And I'm also a very big fan of the show Breaking Bad. I told Bradley, where is he, that I would mention Breaking Bad. He thought I was kidding. I'm not. I like to start off my events by giving away a book. The first person who answers this question correctly gets the book. And if you can't answer the question, it's like skins in golf. It rolls over. Who is this? Really? Netflix CEO. Me. 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 We have a tie. I heard Netflix CEO, which is correct, but you didn't get the name. Alex, we need a Jeopardy ruling here. Um, let's give them each a book. Okay. You each get a book. Everybody wins. This is Reed Hastings. I had the privilege of speaking at Netflix on Monday about the book. And Netflix is one of the companies that I discuss in great detail in the visual organization. In previous books, I have discussed companies like Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google. Uh, my best book in terms of sales is called The Age of the Platform, which led me to Mr. Andrew Carpey. I had the pleasure of meeting tonight, fellow Carnegie Mellon alumnus and Tartan. I was at Carnegie Mellon a few hours ago and asked them if they were still the Tartans. And more important, what is a Tartan? They said it was a color. Why your school mascot would be based on a color as opposed to a bulldog. So it's not a Crimean Tartan. I don't know the difference. We can have a discussion. <laughs> but in previous books, I've written about Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google, and how they've embraced the platform as their business model. Uh, soon after that book came out, I started thinking about some of the other sort of ramifications of platforms. And to make a long story short, platforms generate a lot of data. That became the genesis for my fifth book, Too Big to Ignore, The Business Case for Big Data. And that book led to the visual organization. Someone in a blog post a couple weeks ago had astutely observed that big data is sort of the back end, but visualization is the front end. In other words, most people aren't terribly technical. They don't know what Hadoop is, much less how to configure it. They don't understand the difference between a relational database with tables that are linked and a distributed file system. They don't know what you're talking about when you say things like parallel processing and fault tolerance. But it shouldn't matter. These days, the tools have progressed to the point at which they're actually very democratic, very user friendly. We don't want people going to the IT department to be productive. Now, when I think about all the companies that do big data well, one can make the argument that none does big data better than Netflix, but don't listen to me. Here are some stats on Netflix. For instance, Netflix sports 40 million customers. The vast majority of them <coughs> live in the United States and access the service by streaming. We were talking before a little bit about disruption. Interesting story, when Hastings co-founded the company in late 97, early 1998, he called it Netflix. But the company was sending out DVDs by mail. In other words, he understood that eventually he would disrupt himself. And that's exactly what Netflix has done. As tablets and smartphones, as broadband have become more prevalent, as a percentage, fewer people subscribe to DVDs by mail. Because think about it, that's not terribly efficient, right? You're spending a boatload just on postage, not to mention DVDs get broken, they get lost. Being able to stream video to millions of people concurrently is now more possible. Netflix also sports a $27 billion market cap, but perhaps my favorite Netflix statistic is as follows. It is responsible for nearly one third of all US internet nighttime traffic during the weekday. Now, now how much of that is <laughs> I don't know, but they do. <laughs> As an aside, when I spoke at Netflix on Monday, I had gotten up at four to fly in from Las Vegas, where I live, and I had given a talk at Autodesk. I saw my first 3D printer in person. That was very cool. And I misspoke. I said that Netflix was responsible for one fifth of US nighttime internet traffic. And I would say about 75 people within one second <laughs> concurrently corrected me. <laughs> they are very proud of their data at Netflix. In fact, I did not know this a week ago. 
there is such a thing as a tech Emmy. And Netflix has won a couple of them. I took a selfie, and I'm not a selfie guy, of myself with two tech Emmys. Because Netflix generates so much data, they are particularly interested in net neutrality. And for those of you who haven't heard the term, the general concept behind net neutrality is that all data on the web should be treated equally. If Comcast, which I understand is the sort of primary ISP here, started taxing Netflix data, you're not paying $8 a month. So a few more interesting Netflix facts. It is the single biggest customer of Amazon Web Services, AWS. For those of you who don't know, AWS is a $5 billion a year business inside of Amazon. At some point in 2006, someone inside of Amazon said, golly, we generate an awful lot of compute power that just <coughs> vanishes into the ether. We don't need it all. What if we sold it? After some tweaks, it's become this massive business that's growing at 50% a year. The net result is that more than ever, it's easy, or I should say easier, to start a company. In other words, you don't need millions of dollars in infrastructure. I'm old enough to remember the first dot-com boom of 98, 99. And one of the stats that stuck out, um, sticks out for me is that Salon.com needed $100 million for just its infrastructure. You don't need nearly that much today. There is a flip side, though. When you rely on AWS like Netflix does, you save a great deal of money. In other words, Netflix need not buy or build its own data centers, right? Billions of dollars in employee employees, electricity costs. You save a great deal of money. The downside is that if there's ever a problem with AWS, people tend not to criticize Amazon because, say, on Christmas of 2012, when Netflix went down, people couldn't watch Breaking Bad or whatever movie. They had to talk to their families. We can't have that. As a result, Netflix hashtag fail was trending on Twitter. So there's a downside of relying upon AWS. But I mentioned before that Hastings understood the nature of disruption. He wanted to disrupt himself. Well, Netflix is also disrupting Hollywood. Are there any fans of the show House of Cards in the audience? Mm. Decent number? Okay. We're going to talk a lot about House of Cards today, but Netflix in September of 2013 became the first non-TV network to win an Emmy. And Netflix is not just doing House of Cards, which was originally a BBC series, and it spent $100 million creating 13 episodes of it without even a pilot, and I'll come back to the data behind that decision. But Netflix has experimented with Orange is the New Black, Lilyhammer, it brought back one of my favorite shows, Arrested Development, any Arrested Development fans out there, nice. Hey, brother. <laughs> you watch the show, you got that joke. The obvious question to me as I was researching this book and thinking a lot about big data is very simple and very short. How? How can Netflix do all <clears throat> this stuff? And the short answer to that question is another single word, data. As I researched Netflix, I discovered something absolutely fascinating. There is a three-part data credo inside of Netflix that drives not just the IT department, but really the whole culture. And when I was there, I should have took a picture of this one, but they literally have data visualizations on the wall hung in framed pictures. They are very proud, as I said, of their data at Netflix, and they really should be. At Netflix, data should be accessible, easy to discover, and easy to process for everyone. We talked before a lot about transparency. Well, Netflix, I would argue, walks the talk at Netflix the default sort of modus operandi is that data should be shared. Now, that doesn't mean that everyone gets to see everything. Right? If you're an engineer and you're an engineer, it's not like we know how much each other make. But Netflix really does a great deal with regard to sharing information to ultimately make better business decisions. I'll describe later how, in my opinion, many companies that think they're doing big data may be collected, but they don't analyze it and they don't necessarily act on it. Well, if you're not going to do anything with it, why carry that club in your bag? Forget the ridiculous amount of information that Netflix collects on its customers. 40 million, most of whom are streaming. Netflix knows when you're pausing, when you resume, what you're selecting, right? That's table stakes for them. 
Netflix understands that there's only so much data that they can generate, even though it's boatloads of data. In fact, Netflix purchases additional data and metadata, which for those of you who don't know is data about data, from firms like Nielsen, which is a global information and management company. As an example of metadata, I'm sure many of you remember the PRISM scandal, the NSA, and the government's defense was that we're not listening on your calls, we're just tracking the metadata. In other words, if I call Michael at 6.52 and we talk for 15 minutes and I'm in Las Vegas and Michael's in San Francisco, that's all they're capturing. They weren't capturing the content of our call. Whoever thought that they would hear President Obama say the word metadata. Geeks around the world raise the arms. <laughs> so Netflix isn't just content with the information that it can generate itself, but it purchases additional data and metadata to make more informed decisions. But it gets even better than that. As I discovered after the book came out, that's just the nature of writing about technology, I knew for a long time that computers and algorithms can only do so much. A couple months ago in Las Vegas, I had the opportunity to see Ray Kurzweil speak. Anyone know who he is? Uh, for those of you who don't know, Ray Kurzweil is probably one of the smartest men alive. He has invented things like the first e-reader in, was it, 1976. He's written a bunch of books. He has made predictions that people think are crazy, like, oh, I don't know, in 1990, he said that by 1999, a computer would beat the world's best chess player at chess. And people said, you're crazy. And you know what? He was wrong. It happened a year before he made that prediction. So computers and algorithms can only get you so far. They can't do everything yet, although Kurzweil thinks that it's only a matter of time. In fact, by 2045, he predicts that man will be fused with machine. This is the singularity that he mentions in one of his books. But Netflix understands that at this point, computers and data from algorithms have limitations. As a result, Netflix pays people to watch movies. Now, they're not paying them to go, did you like it or not? You get trained for a couple of days at Netflix. We want you to evaluate movies based upon certain criteria. In other words, they're trying to minimize, if not eliminate, the subjectivity involved in watching movies. And because of that, Netflix can go so far beyond general categorizations, like comedies, the rest of development. Note the orange color here. We're going to come back to that. Things like dramas or westerns or documentaries, right? That's table stakes. That isn't terribly difficult to discern. I read an Atlantic article a couple of months ago by an independent reporter who more or less proved that Netflix was doing some really interesting things. Netflix essentially gave the non-denial denial. Netflix was able to break its movies into 77,000 different subgenres, and I read that article and I could not believe my eyes that at Netflix there is a subgenre like dark, suspenseful sci fi horror movies. Okay, that's pretty specific, but it gets even better. Those should not be confused with gritty, suspenseful revenge westerns. Evidently, there's such a thing as a gritty, suspenseful non revenge western. <laughs> Romantic Indian crime dramas. I can't name one, but evidently it exists because it's dramas, so there must be more than one. Evil kid horror movies. I can't recall seeing one. Maybe the, the Chucky ones? But evidently, that's a categorization. Visually striking goofy action and adventures, and then finally, violent suspenseful action and adventure from the 1980s. <laughs> Meaning that that category probably exists in the 70s or the 90s. So at Netflix, they have a tremendous amount of data not only to describe what people are watching, but as we'll see soon, predict. And this is very important because does anyone here not have a cell phone? Okay. And I'm imagining that those who do have AT&T or Verizon or T-Mobile. In other words, you're locked into a two-year contract. If you want to break it, you have to pay. That's not the case with Netflix. It's not the case with Salesforce.com, another company here in San Francisco. In other words, Netflix isn't really using the stick, it's using the carrot. As long as Netflix can serve up relevant content, you'll keep paying $8 a month. So this data at Netflix is very important. The second part of the credo is that the longer you take to find the data, the less valuable it becomes. Now, these days it's definitely a cliche. Most companies believe that it's important to act now. Right? Things can trend immediately. Does anyone know who Justine Sacco is? Oh, this is a good story. Justine Sacco went from a pretty much nobody 
to trending on Twitter over the course of, I think, about 20 minutes because she tweeted the following. She should have known better. If you're a 12-year-old and you tweet something inappropriate, you're 12. But if you're a 34-year-old PR executive at a Fortune 500 company on her way to Africa and you tweet, I think I can recite this verbatim, going to Africa, hope I don't get AIDS, just kidding, I'm white. By the time she was in the air, which I guess didn't have Wi-Fi, <laughs> has Justine landed yet? was trending on Twitter. She was harassed by uh, reporters at the airport who knew when she was landing. Uh, a couple days later, she lost her job. I cannot predict the future, but I guarantee you that in 20 years, if you Google Justine Sacco, that tweet shows up as 1 and 1A. One so things happen very quickly these days, but how many companies understand what's happening in real time? Netflix is one of them. I mentioned before that I am a Breaking Bad fan, and this was my <coughs> failsafe if you did not get the Reed Hastings question. Does anyone know who this is? Walter White, thank you. Brian Cranston, formerly of Seinfeld and Malcolm in the Middle, plays Walter White on the AMC show Breaking Bad. It's my favorite show of all time, and I'm not alone. And I'm going to back that up in a second. For those of you who don't know, Walter White on the show plays a 50-year-old high school chemistry teacher. And he's got a pregnant wife and a son with cerebral palsy, about 15, 16 years old. Because he doesn't make a lot of money, his son has special needs, he also works in a car wash. He's not very wealthy, but he seems pretty happy. He's a really smart guy who just works in high school as a chemistry teacher. One day, the doctor tells me he has terminal lung cancer and six months to live. Now, he wants to provide for his family college costs, medical bills. He doesn't want to burden them with debt. What do you do if you have nothing to lose and an extensive knowledge of chemistry? Those of you who watch the show know that you start manufacturing crystal meth. As Vince Gilligan says, the show's creator, he goes from Mr. Chips to Scarface. Now, I'm a very passionate fan about the show. I went as Walter White wearing a very similar suit for Halloween last year. <laughs> now, that evoked a very binary reaction. Either people didn't know who the hell I was, or I just got that recognition. Did you have the hat or not? I did not wear the hat, but I do own the limited edition Gorin hat of Heisenberg. It wasn't cheap. They only made 1,895 of them because that's when the company was founded. So yes, I do wear the hat. <laughs> now, why am I bringing up Breaking Bad? Well, obviously, I'm very passionate about the show. And in fact, if you go to my website, philsimon.com, and you don't happen to get a book tonight, and you're a fan of Breaking Bad, I'm having a contest if you can find more obscure Breaking Bad references in the book, you'll win a signed copy, I'll send it over to you. There are a decent number. Anyway, Netflix knows that 50,000 Netflix subscribers watched all 13 episodes of season four the day before the premiere of season five. Now, some people say, isn't that kind of crazy? Each episode's about 42 minutes long without commercials, which obviously don't show on Netflix. 13 times 42 is about 10 hours. That's a decent number of hours watching it. Now, some people think that you have moderation issues, but watch Breaking Bad, and a lot of my friends, who initially were skeptical, because I might have a big mouth, said to me, you know what, you're right, it's a really good show. And at 1 o'clock in the morning, and they go, all right, I got, this is the last one. <laughs> the next one ends, and they go, all right, one more. <laughs> Unfortunately, since season three, I was watching Breaking Bad in real time, and I, had to, I could not just watch the next episode. Uh, I had to wait a week or a year. Anyway. This isn't just with Breaking Bad. Ted Sarando serves as the chief content officer of Netflix. Now, I personally believe that in many organizations, we've seen title inflation, chief data officer, chief innovation officer. I'm not saying that those roles aren't important. However, at Netflix, the chief content officer, which is what Ted Sarando does over there, is an incredibly important role. Why? Because Aside from spending $100 million on original content for shows like House of Cards, Netflix licenses content like Breaking Bad from AMC, like the show Dexter with Michael C. Hall about a serial killer who kills other killers from Showtime. So Netflix spends anywhere from 2 to $3 billion a year on content. That's a very big job at Netflix. And when a reporter from Bloomberg West here in San Francisco asks Sarandos, aren't you concerned? Think about your business model. You pay People pay $8 a month to watch a show or a series of shows. 
What if you want to watch House of Cards? What if you just want to binge view on 13 episodes of House of Cards because they're all available at once and then quit and you only get $8 from me and maybe I come back for season two? Sarando's answer was very telling. He didn't say, we hope it doesn't happen or it probably doesn't happen. He said only 8,000 of our customers have done that. Now, 8,000 is a big number. I don't have 8,000 customers. I dare to dream. But 8,000 on top of 40 million is a rounding error. So Netflix knows exactly what its customers are doing. And the third part of this Netflix data credo is the focus of my talk tonight. Whether a data set is large or small, being able to visualize it makes it easier to explain. You're empowering users. You're letting them ask better questions. You're constantly tweaking algorithms in your business processes. Does anyone know who this is? Kevin Spacey. Kevin Spacey. Kevin Spacey is one of my favorite actors. These are four of my favorite Kevin Spacey films. Glenn Gary Glenn Ross, one of my top five based on the David the Met play. His first Oscar as Best Supporting Actor as a Roger Verbal Kint, a.k.a. Kaiser Soze in The Usual Suspects. He plays John Doe, the serial killer, in the movie Seven, directed by David Fincher. And then finally, his Oscar-winning performance as lead actor is Lester Burnham in the movie American Beauty, which is a little bit like Breaking Bad, except for the meth. <laughs> now, why am I talking about Kevin Spacey? His current project, many of you may know, is House of Cards. And this is the iconic cover imagery from House of Cards. Uh, for those of you who don't know, it was based on a BBC series. Essentially, it's a remake and Netflix decided to basically buy it without seeing so much as a pilot. In many Hollywood studios or television networks, you don't get anywhere without a pilot. Netflix, as we'll see shortly, had the data to actually make that decision. Even though there was some risk involved, it actually wasn't all that risky because Netflix had so much information. This particular cover, I believe, isn't by design. Kevin Spacey <laughs> here looks very authoritative on the show. He plays the House Majority Whip in season one. I haven't seen season two. I don't want to ruin it for people who haven't seen it, but he looks very um, authoritative there. And he's a white guy around 50 years old. He's actually very similar to Patrick Stewart when you think about it on this cover from the PBS series Macbeth. Another white guy, a little less hair, even though Spacey wears a wig or has had surgery. There's some red there, but mostly it's black. Now, these titles, these images appear to be similar, but at Netflix they want to know how similar. And when I was researching the book, I discovered that Netflix actually quantifies the colors on the cover imagery to say specifically how black is black, how turquoise is turquoise. And this isn't just for one particular movie. Netflix uses this information for movie recommendations and TV recommendations. In other words, Michael may enjoy orange comedies. Uh, Krishna may uh, enjoy black dramas. Rod may not care about any of that. The point is Netflix can segment its customers beyond 77 different subgenres. When you start factoring the colors, you kind of start approaching infinity. I mentioned before Arrested Development, which has an orange cover. It still has some similarities with another original series, Hemlock Grove. So Netflix not only decided to do this, but uses this information to tweak the algorithm that recommends. It's constantly learning about what you're watching, what you're liking. Now, how does it know what you like? Well, a couple things. First, there's a rating, one through five star. But even more important than that, did you actually finish the movie? Right? It's unlikely that you watched only three minutes of House of Cards and think it's a five star show, right? That doesn't make a great deal of sense. So what does Netflix know about its streaming customers? At a minimum, it knows what you watch. That isn't terribly impressive. It knows what you're clicking on, right? It knows if you have the DVD service, which movies they're sending to you. It gets so much easier than that, uh, more impressive than that, though. If you go back to 1997, 1998, Netflix had no idea about when you were watching, right? How could they? We sent you a DVD on Monday. It arrived on Tuesday. If you sent it back on two weeks from then, it has no idea about when you watched it, right? It hadn't embedded any sensors in the DVDs. <laughs> well, these days, because of streaming, Netflix knows exactly when you watch. And when you think about the power of that information, think about the inferences that you can make. For instance, if you watch with your home account children's movies at 10 o'clock in the morning, there's a decent chance that you have children. If you're watching horror movies at, all throughout the day, unless you're a questionable parent, maybe you don't have kids. 
But Netflix knows the device on which you're watching. I'm old enough to remember Netflix when you essentially got the DVD and plugged it in your DVD player or your DVD drive on your laptop or your desktop. Well, these days, tablets, smartphones, Xboxes, Playstations, and Netflix has all of this synchronized, a lot like Amazon does. In other words, if any of you read books on a Kindle, let's say you're sitting on the subway, you dial up your Kindle app, you're reading it on your phone. But you go home, you want to sit in your bed and read on a bigger screen on your iPad or your um, other tablet. You don't have to forward to that page. Netflix, I'm sorry, Amazon and Netflix know where you started and when you can resume. And Netflix knows when you paused and when you resume watching. Now, in the book, I argue, and we were talking about this a bit before, about whether you can actually do anything with that information. Right? Having this information in and of itself doesn't really do anything, but at Netflix, these companies are actually putting this information into action. They're making better decisions. Because as I argue in the book, he with the most data doesn't win. In fact, in this era of big data, and Michael and I were talking about this before, it's about turning that data into information and into knowledge, but even beyond that, doing something with it. And to me, there's this human aspect of the book. I try to focus on how people are turning this information into insights, but you have to act on them. This isn't the first book on data visualization, far from it. Many books have been written. But I really tried to focus on what companies were actually doing, because many of the books on data visualization from Edward Tufte and Stephen Pugh and Nathan Yao tend to focus on what could be done. I was much more interested in exploring what companies are actually doing. These are some of the thoughts in my head as I was thinking about what to do next. How do we make sense of all this data? How are progressive companies turning this data into insight? And most important, what can we learn from them? As I mentioned in the previous book, Too Big to Ignore, I cover big data and why it matters. But trust me, there's a great deal that you can learn from visualization. And not just in the workplace. In fact, as I argue in the book, data and data viz are actually everywhere, right? This era of big data. Has anyone heard of the consumerization of IT? Right. For those of you who haven't, if you go back 15 years, we went to work to use the best technology. Now, many of us are carrying around smartphones and tablets that are tantamount to, if not superior to, the technology we have at work. If you don't like the applications to some extent that your companies are using, if you've ever heard of BYOD, bring your own device, it isn't very difficult now to essentially <laughs> fly under the radar to circumvent IT. This is not just about organizations, it's about more visual employees who are also, by the way, visual consumers, and I'll talk about that shortly. We're living in this era of a more visual government. Has anyone ever been to data.gov? Right, there's an increasing amount of open data and linked data. I've seen some really interesting data visualizations put together about commuter types, who's tweeting by area, what time of the day. And think about it, if you're riding BART at 5 p.m., and you're sitting in traffic, maybe you tweet. There's also a more visual citizen. And as I'll talk about shortly, there's a more visual journalist. Has anyone ever read anything by Nate Silver, either his blog or uh, his excellent book, The Signal and the Noise? Really good stuff. There's also a more visual athlete. And I want to talk a little bit about this era of big data and how we almost go into work now expecting to make our case through data. Whether or not management lets us is a separate discussion, but uh, the, I, I would argue that the geeks have inherited the earth, but fortunately they've left us with some tools to make sense of all this data. Around nine months ago, I was in Manhattan keynoting a conference on big data and healthcare. And I try to get to places early. Um, Seinfeld has a great line, he said, we never should have put a man on the moon. Because once we did that, now we can say we can put a man on the moon, but we can't get the AV to work or whatever. So I'm a big believer in getting there early. And as I'm walking to the conference, I stop and I see this sign in front of a dry cleaner in Manhattan. And it's a simple bar graph of Yelp reviews for this particular dry cleaner. Now, no disrespect to any dry cleaners in the audience, but it's not like it's necessarily the most technologically advanced type of organization. But they understood that if you represented your data in a visual way, it would catch your eye. Mine is not an academic book. I'm not a neuroscientist. But in researching the book and data visualization and how the brain responds to data presented in a visual format, I was amazed to discover that depending on the data and depending on the brain, right? not all brains are created equal, we recognize patterns in information anywhere from 60 to 60,000 times faster if that data is visualized. 
I would not have stopped to take this picture if the sign read, we're a really good dry cleaner. Customers love us, but the fact that maybe it's just me and I like data, I saw this, I took the picture. Now, I went to Yelp as a user because let's face it, Yelp hinges upon contributions unpaid from people like us. If you take away the data, what purpose does Yelp serve? Kind of like Facebook, right? It's not like it's Apple. They sell me a MacBook Pro, they sell me an iPad, they sell me Apple TV. Facebook is all about data. I go to Yelp and within two clicks, I didn't have to export this to Excel, I didn't have to play with access, I didn't have to create a pivot table or a chart. I saw that most of my reviews come from either Las Vegas, Manhattan, or Caldwell. I live in Las Vegas. I used to live in Caldwell, New Jersey. Anyone know which show was based in Caldwell, New Jersey? James Gandolfini. Oh, no, no. Sopranos. Sopranos. So most of my reviews are coming from these areas, but this was just one way to cut the data. One click later, bang, I see that this is how I review different types of businesses. I guess I'm very opinion about restaurants. Now, without going into the actual data, my hunch is that I'm not giving a review with three stars. I either loved it, five stars, or hated it, one star. Now, this isn't just about consumers. This is about athletes as well. Does anyone know who this is? Ray Allen. Ray Allen, nice. Give the man a book. <laughs> Ray Allen, for those of you who don't know, plays backup for the most part shooting guard of the Miami Heat. He is the all-time leader in NBA three-point shooting, both in terms of percentage and in terms of makes. This is a shot chart. In other words, Ray Allen makes more shots in this area circled red. But also think here about the frequency. It doesn't make a great deal of sense for Ray Allen to take an 18-foot two-point shot because he can step back two feet. And even though the percentage drops a little bit, the payoff from a two-point shot to a three-point shot is 50% higher. It's not a coincidence that he goes to these specific places. And this isn't just one stats geek. Michael Lewis's Moneyball, the book, the movie, has absolutely changed the way that many sports are operating, particularly with regard to the NFL and concussions. They're working on sensors. It doesn't make sense. Not all hits are created equal. Not all brains are created equal. What if there were some device to tell you that so-and-so is at risk for a concussion? NFL teams are working on this right now. Uh, before you move that slide, I think you got a data problem. Okay. I'm just kidding. But uh, we have a guard for the Warriors. His name is Curry. Steph Curry, yep. Yep, Steph Curry has a better percentage than Allen. Well, Check I'm saying out. this is just his shot chart. But yes, yeah, Steph Curry is a machine. Although, Warriors coach Mark Jackson, who just turned 49 years old, beat him in a three-point contest in practice a couple months ago, which I thought was interesting. <laughs> anyway, talk about basketball. Just having fun. Anyone know who this is? Elon Musk. Elon Musk. Anyone watch the 60 Minutes piece on Musk the other night? I thought it was really interesting. And in 2013, Musk was telling the world about the performance of Tesla cars. Now, I've never driven one. I had sort of driven by one on the highway the other day. It's a beautiful looking car. But Musk had some very specific claims about what his car can do. OK, not the first CEO to make some claims. New York Times journalist John Broder quickly went out and said, I want to see if these claims pass the smell test. Now, he didn't just take it for a ride and go, eh, or a great ride. He specifically and meticulously documented what he was doing, how far he was driving, how fast, when he got a charge, what route he took. And his data did not jive with Musk's data. Now, this wasn't the first time that a journalist and a CEO of a prominent company disagreed. And to be fair, Broder wasn't some 12-year-old with a Tumblr blog. He was a New York Times reporter. When you review something in a negative way, that review is going to have some legs. It's the first time I can recall that a journalist and a CEO were arguing about data. What was your methodology? How fast? I mean, very specific. So journalists are becoming more data-oriented. And not just the New York Times, but MIT, the Wall Street Journal. Data is transforming journalism before our eyes. Yet, as I thought about all these things taking place, I did not see very many data visualization case studies. In fact, in one of my favorite tweets, I had a student, grad student over at the University of, I believe, Northwestern, Northwestern University, tweet at me going, where are all the data viz case studies? Because on my blog, I created a post for looking for data viz case studies want to be in the book. Well, just because I couldn't find them didn't necessarily mean that they didn't exist. But as someone who enjoys data, I googled it. 
And on August 31st, 2013, I found 23 examples of data visualization case studies in quotes. And of those 23, two of them were my own queries going, where are all the data visualization case studies? Contrast that with ERP, enterprise resource planning case studies. There were thousands of them, CRM, customer relationship management. So I didn't see a great many case studies with regard to data visualization. Some of the ones that are out there from software vendors that were very sort of generic and bland and quite frankly self-promotional. Company X use our data viz and we like it. How does that help you? I don't think it does. One of the most fascinating examples I found though was from a company called Autodesk and an employee by the name of Justin Macheka up in Canada created a tool called the org or chart. We're here to talk about people and work and productivity and data. And by way of background, before I started writing and speaking, I spent a great deal of time helping companies implement new systems. Um, the vast majority of which informed my first book, Why New Systems Fail, which I'm not joking when I say that if I didn't write that book, I would have needed to go into therapy. <laughs> Macheka took org chart, I'm sorry, took Autodesk information and created this stunning visualization. He took four years worth of data and created the following. It is an interactive data visualization that looks quite frankly like it's something from space. At the middle of this organization is a CEO. And we see, you can pause it, you can rewind it, you can zoom in. This is movement inside the organization. In my career implementing HR and payroll and financial systems, I created thousands of reports for people. Some of them were pretty cool. None of them was as cool as this one. Now, you may be looking at this and saying to yourself, this doesn't tell me necessarily what I need to do. And that's my point. When someone had me design a dashboard or a standard report, hey, Phil, can you give me all employee exits in the next six months? Hey, Phil, can you tell me all employees are paid X number of dollars? Those are very discrete requests, and I met those requests that was my job. Those tools, I would argue, didn't encourage data discovery. In other words, I need a report that lists all the problems. Here's that report, no problems, we're good. With something like this, you're actually able to ask questions. Why is this thing going on in the left? What's up with that? And to me, the most drastic example, and this is in the book, of this movement took place when the Autodesk went through a reorg. Chaos ensued. It looked like the Big Bang. Now, I've talked about Autodesk, 7,000 employees, Netflix, 24 billion or $27 billion market cap. Most companies aren't anywhere near that size. My third book is called The New Small. It's about small businesses and emerging technologies. I thought that book would blow up. Why? Because there are 28 million small businesses in this country. And I figured if I could sell to 1% of them, 280,000. And if I were off by a factor of 10, that's 28,000. In point of fact, most companies aren't the size of Amazon, Apple, Facebook, Google, and Netflix. But I argue in the book that size does not matter. And I profile a company in Las Vegas called Wedgies. They're a startup. And they do social polling. They integrate with Twitter and now Tumblr. In other words, whatever question you have, you can ask through Twitter. You log in through the API, you're connected, and you ask questions like, oh, I don't know. Who is the more despicable New York politician? Is it Anthony Weiner, who did what his last name implies? Or is it Elliot Spitzer? who was involved in a call girl ring. And I was wondering who was more despicable, and I generated a quick poll. And with wedgies, you can add either a simple picture or an animated JPEG, because pictures are sticky. Case in point, Pinterest has a valuation of, I don't know, four to $8 billion. But that's just the front end. On the back end, Twitter uses, in some cases, some simple tools like Google Analytics, but also some custom stuff like D3, which is an open source data visualization program to create dashboards to understand what's going on. Before, I mentioned Amazon Web Services, AWS. If you're a six-person startup, you're not going to drop anywhere near $20 million to prove your concept. You use AWS, and when your polls start to explode, you need to up your provisioning with AWS. In the book, I write about how a USA Today reporter, Jeff Glick, created a wedgie for a NASCAR um, poll, and the question was, since most NASCAR races take place on uh, concrete or pavement, I'm not a big NASCAR guy, but NASCAR decided to do one on dirt. Do you like this? 93% of the people said yes, but the number of people who voted was actually very high, forcing Netflix to respond in real time. They could see what was going on. So this notion that you have to be a very big company to embrace the principles of a visual organization, I think, is completely misplaced. 
In fact, Netflix, I'm sorry, Wedgies is built in such a way that if they go from 6 to 60 to 600 to 6,000, the infrastructure there, the mindset is there. And because I profiled them in the book and they're friends of mine, we went to see Anchorman 2 together. It's a very funny movie, by the way. If they blow up, I said, you guys owe me something because clearly it has nothing to do with your work and everything to do with my book. <laughs> That's a joke. So big, small, industry, doesn't matter. What are the characteristics of a visual organization? And in the book, I say that visual organizations eschew this notion of set it and forget it. In 2005, I went to a utility company in New Jersey, and they were going through a system implementation. To make a long story short, they needed me to design a tool that would extract data from one part of the database, monkey with it, or transform it, and load it into another part. That's called ETL. The tool worked, I did my job. Five years later, they were going through an upgrade. I guess I didn't offend them because they called me and said, come back. I come back and I recognize some familiar faces, I shake some hands, and I see a computer with a Microsoft Access database that I didn't know I had designed, but it looks like something I would have. And I went to the woman and said, God, you have really great design skills. I wasn't being facetious, I didn't remember that I recognized it. And she laughed and said, you know you built this, right? To which I responded, does it work still? She says, yes. I said, did you have to tweak it? She goes, no. See question number one. Now that was a tool that did something very uh, sort of discreet, but a visual organization is constantly tweaking. If you're Netflix and you're already the leader in streaming, why quantify the colors on movies? Because you can make the algorithm better, because you can predict, because you can keep people paying $8 a month and you can get more people to pay $8 a month. They also encourage data exploration and discovery. You can't tell me that somebody at Netflix said, all right, you can quantify the movie's colors, but only if you think it'll have an ROI of 10%. Come on, how do you know that that's going to matter? You don't. They also recognize the limitations of reporting stalwarts, KPI, standard reports, dashboards. Now, I'm not completely oblivious. I know that a tool like org or chart, as cool as it is, does not obviate the need for a P&L, for a uh, payroll register. Uh, the point is that those tools still matter, but they don't encourage data discovery. And that's exactly what we need to do in this era of big data. Right? We have to ask better questions of our data. There is a reason for the subtitle. Part of it reads, the quest for better decisions. I don't think that we're ever really finished. Netflix in five years, Google in five years will do things that they can't do today. They can do things today that they couldn't do five years ago. They also build and buy tools as necessary. You can't tell me that someone at... Netflix walked into an Office Max and said, you know, I'll, I'll buy the uh, product that quantifies the colors of movies. They built it. Why? Because they thought it would be useful. Now, if these are the characteristics, what are the myths? First up, we have to visualize all the data. That's completely nonsense. You're never going to get all of the data. About two, three years ago, companies started to get their arms around social data, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook. And before you knew it, Pinterest comes out of nowhere. It was kind of like a game of whack-a-mole. People say, I don't care about Pinterest. I'm still trying to struggle with this other stuff. Look at Pinterest engagement numbers. Pinterest is a potentially valuable source for certain companies. You're never going to have all the data. Next up, many companies say, well, we don't want to do anything because we can only visualize the good data. Really? I would argue that the easiest way to see an outlier is to look at a bunch of data and go, why is this thing over here? So that's, I believe, um, misguided. Some people believe that visualization will always manifest the right action or the right decision. Again, I think that's nonsense. Mark Twain once said a long time ago that there are lies, damn lies, and statistics. That is still true today. You absolutely can manipulate the x-axis and the y-axis. You can make a stock that's very volatile appear very stable and vice versa. There's a great book that I read recently called Drunk Tank Pink. Anyone ever read that one? It's a great book. It's called Drunk Tank Pink because in the 50s and the 60s, High school football teams would paint the opposing locker teams a very specific shade of pink. Why? Because subconsciously, that messed with their heads and they were less aggressive. That gave an advantage to the home team. There are ways with design to manipulate. Just because data is visualized doesn't mean that it will manifest the right action or decision. Nor will it lead to certainty. I don't believe that certainty exists in an era of big data. Netflix, which to me is the king of the big data companies was not certain that House of Cards would not be a hundred million dollar flop. Netflix had the data to justify the decision. As for lessons, 
user experience is important. You don't want to develop in a cathedral. It's much more bizarre oriented. You want people to be involved in the process. The worst thing you can do is have IT sit for six months and develop something and then go to the users and go, okay, it's finished. Hopefully it works. No, you want them involved. Also, experimentation is paramount. When I talked to Justin Majeka about org org chart, I said, this is amazing. I'm betting that you did not sit down, build step one and all the way to 10 in a linear fashion. He said, no, there were troughs and valleys. Walk before you run. No company, even Netflix, became Netflix overnight. It's very easy, I believe, to be intimidated by Google and Amazon and Netflix because of what they can do. Again, it's an iterative process, it's a journey. This is one reason that I don't like this notion of a big data project. Um, at Netflix and Google, they're constantly doing things. There's, it's never really finished. It's more of a marathon than a sprint. They also avoid the quarterly visualization mentality of far too many organizations, in my opinion. People only visualize data because it's a quarterly meeting, an annual report, something like that. You're asking questions of the data, you're interacting with it. In the book, I argue that there's only so much you can do with a static data viz of small data. If you have large amounts of data that you can visualize and interact with, then you can ask better questions. Here it is, transparency. In the book, I talk about the University of Texas and how they are making a large amount of data available to not just administrators and employees, but anyone with an internet connection. Go to the University of Texas productivity dashboard, and you can slice and dice data as much as you want. Stuart Brand said in 1972 that all information wants to be free. We are absolutely seeing that these days with the explosion of open data and linked data. This notion that all data is required is absolute nonsense. A couple weeks ago, I did an interview about the new book for Tech Cocktail, and the last question was, hey, Phil, how do you use data visualization? I write, I speak. My answer was, not as much as I'd like. In other words, and some of you I was talking to before are authors who've written books. Well, if you've written books, you probably sell your book on Amazon. If you're an author and you sign up for Amazon Author Central, you can access information about your books. Now, you don't know who bought the book because if you did, right, and you're Amazon, and Michael bought my book, well, why do I need you? I'm just going to sell directly. You've been disintermediated. But Amazon does make available heat maps. In other words, I can tell that in San Francisco, more people buy my book than in Omaha, Nebraska. What can I do with that information? I can tweet my Google AdWords. Maybe I will pay more for a click in Seattle or San Francisco than I will in Nebraska. So you don't need all data to begin. And then finally, it's important to iterate. I don't believe, as I said before, that we live in this era of set it and forget it. I have time for a few questions. Here's how you contact me.